And that's what's really, really unique about this gathering in comparison with maybe any other gathering that I've ever participated in my life. Everyone is here for one purpose, and that is that they cry. They hope that they are able to have their emotion invoked to the state whereby they're able to be so overcome by the tragedy of the story, enable that it releases literally tears to come down from their eyes. Someone says that's so strange. It is really strange if you really think about it from like a bird's eye view. For many of us who have been living in it, have been practicing it for many years, it's not that strange. We know what it's about and we've been doing it for so many years. But it really emanates and sort of demonstrates in reality a really intense love for this personality and for his family and for, again, the values that he speaks to. And through performing the rituals, that of poetry, that of the eulogy that I'm going to read, again, in order to invoke people's emotions, that of the poetry that we perform after the recitation of the eulogy, and so on and so forth, is really something, again, to illuminate the values, that of patience, that of generosity, that of beauty, that of love, all of those things, because again, we believe that he is a man who really emanated and manifested all of those things within the course of a couple of hours. And really, if you go ahead and you read the, the story, which is again, narrated in books of history, and there is you know, a lot of conversation about it, not only within Muslim circles, but really sort of, if we extend that all across the world today, it is super tragic. And it also shows a sense of real uniqueness to, to this individual and really what, why so many people are drawn uh, toward this very, very uh, unique anecdote. But nonetheless, uh, thank you all for coming and um, you are certainly bringing a lot of blessing to our gathering. Uh, that said, please, once again, if we can ask people to move forward. There is not that much space over here, but there's a lot of space over there. There's some space in the back over there. There's some space over there. There's a large empty circle right over here. Um, I know it's tight, and if, and, if, and if guys can move, sort of squeeze into the empty places, because as people are gonna come in, then we're gonna have to say it many times, please come in, please come in, please come in, please come in. We say it one time, everyone does it one time. We're all comfortable. Secondly, just a couple of sort of logistic things. Um, Alhamdulillah, as we've been mentioning and updating the last couple of nights, during the course of the next several weeks, we are doing our very best to fundraising toward the support of these programs, in which we are trying to reach the goal of raising $100,000, and inshallah, we are going to reach that goal very, very soon. Yesterday, I updated you all that we had reached $31,000 and some change. Today, it's 8.38, 24 hours from yesterday, and we have reached $62,175. Please recite, salawat ala. We are entering into the fourth night of this 10-day ritual, and we are at $62,000, which is very, very incredible. For those of you who know and are aware of what this community has the capability to do and to be. You will know that this past Ramadan, we raised $900,000 in the course of eight or nine days toward building a domestic violence shelter for survivors, for women survivors and children. That's hopefully going to be built out in the next couple of years, inshallah. For those of you who know a little bit about this community, then you know that two years ago during the month of Ramadan, a year and a half ago, we raised more than a million dollars towards supporting the Rohingya community, um, which have really been persecuted over the last several years. A million dollars in the month of Ramadan. And why we are stressing, again, this particular fundraiser, is we're trying to reach $100,000 during the course of these nights, inshallah, is because this little bit gives us the inspiration to do all of that. We raise more money for external organizations and to support institutions outside of the Islamic Center than we raise ourselves for our own operating budget. And that goes to the fact that there's a lot of blessing in the contribution that anyone and everyone is giving. Someone said, I'm going to, this is a true story, someone told me a little while ago that don't worry, inshallah, I'm going to make a contribution when I have something substantial to contribute. It's not about having something substantial to contribute because it's not about the number. 
but it's about the intention that goes behind the contribution. And I promise you that every dollar that's given in a way that is sincere, understanding and believing that this is really allowing for the growth of these young people that you saw today. Muhammad was an NYU student, Rida was an NYU student, and all of those others who you're going to see and who you have seen over the last couple of days in very sort of visible positions, volunteering at our center, and really allowing for these programs to influence them and give them a sense of pride and identity within their faith and within their religion and within their spirituality, that's because of the contributions that you make and the growth that we are able to make after this initial contribution of supporting these programming is unlimited. So don't say we already we reach this number, someone else will contribute. You go and you make a contribution and you do it in the way of God and you will see that we as a community will reap the benefit and just see again how impactful that these programs are moving forward inshallah by your blessing. The third announcement, sort of again to reiterate what's been said already, is that we have these shirts for sale. They're really, really cool, okay? And like I said, my dream is that we have 100 people wearing the shirt. Just make a $20 contribution, you get a shirt, also wear the shirt, it sh demonstrates a sense of support for uh, what we're trying to do over here. Everything is going towards supporting the community. I do not get any profits off of the shirts, I promise. Go and wear the shirt, it's really, really cool. Uh, we ordered some more because we know that all of these are going to get sold out uh, in the next couple of nights, so please make sure that you buy these. <laughs> um, there's also water bottles outside, We're selling tea every single day, so on and so forth. Everything is going toward contributing uh, toward the programming. What else, Hannah? On Saturday, inshallah. On Saturday, we're going to be having our fundraising dinner. Uh, it's going to be at 7 p.m. Uh, upstairs in the fifth floor. Uh, it's going to be with special guest speaker, former NBA star, uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. Again, the proceeds of that program also are going to be supporting these programs. And we'll have a lot more detail again about where your money's going and how your contributions have been effective in the past and so on and so forth. Please go online at our Eventbrite link. You have to RSVP. It's going to make it really beneficial for us in terms of understanding who's coming, how much food we have to order, so on and so forth. So please, we only have 87 RSVPs. There's more than 87 people in this room right now. And I can imagine that on Saturday night, there's going to be far more than 87 people in the room. So please, it's going to take you 45 seconds, right? Just don't do it when I'm lecturing, please, inshallah. Even if you're really falling asleep, it makes me feel bad, and I have a low self-esteem. So don't take out your phone, inshallah, unless you're taking notes. Uh, if I could ask you again all to recite one salawat ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Rahim Allah man qara'a surat al-mubarakat al-fatiha. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وبه نستعين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي يا رسول الله وألا أهل بيتك المذلومين صلى الله عليك يا سيدي يا مولاي مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا غريب يا مذلوم يا أتشان كربلاء ما خاب من تمسك بكم والأمين من لجأ إليكم سادتي يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا ماكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم والقول كالحق والأصدق القائلين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الناس كلوا مما, مما في الأرض حلالا طيبا ولا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان إنه لكم عدو مبين آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم صلى الله عليه وسلم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the whole of Qur'an and the traditions of the Prophet and his family peace and blessings be upon them they stress the idea of living a life that is well-rounded 
and that is holistic within all phases and within all facets of one's life. It's important that we prioritize more than anything our spiritual health. The connection that we have to God is the most important thing that we have within our tradition. If we lose our relationship with God, then we don't have anything at all. And life is a process about striving in terms of gaining in proximity toward our Creator. Understanding that we are a servant and we are a slave and that we live in a universe that submits and succumbs towards, toward God's divine governance and His divine laws. God says that every single day the sun is going to rise and the sun is going to set. There's nothing really we can do about that because we submit to the fact that everything is from the Creator. And through a sense as we've been discussing for so many nights now, us walking in the streets and finding different spaces and looking up at the skies and down at the oceans and seeing the stars and the moon above us, they're all a mechanism and a means by which we are drawn to our Creator. And we are in this process of life toward really striving toward getting closer toward Him, even though we might go through a lot of ups and downs during the course of life. There was once this man, he came to me, and he asked me, he said, how would you define Islam in one sentence, in one phrase? I told him, don't ask me tough questions. <laughs> he said, no, seriously, explain to me Islam in just one sentence. So I took a break, and I thought to reflect upon it for 15 seconds, and I told him that Islam is a process. Islam is a process just like anything and everything else in one's life. It takes time towards submitting. It, towards, it takes time toward cultivating faith. It takes time toward emanating those values which are most important and which are most significant to us. As I mentioned within my introduction earlier on before, that everything in religion is about emanating the most perfect and the most sublime and the most beautiful of qualities. That of mercy and that of patience and that of generosity and that of justice and that of love. And every human being loves those qualities and the religion and religions all across the board, they go and they strive to emanate and illuminate these values more than anything else. So it's about understanding that the most important thing is our spiritual health because we won't look toward those things if we don't see God in the equation. You see, the life that we often live in this part of the world is so consumed with the self. Everything is about what brand you're wearing or where you're eating. Everything is about who you're hanging around with. So much of the world that we live in is about status, it is about symbolism. I'm better than this person because of this. How much money do you have in your bank account? What is your salary? How much is that job going to pay you? Instead of, what are you doing with your money that's making an impact in the world? Do you feel that your work and that your job has a sense of value every day when you wake up in the morning? That's what it's really about and we all know that as human beings but again life is filled with distraction. This world is filled with so many distractions. You're focused, you understand what it is that you got to do. Even during the month of Ramadan, when we do our best toward abstaining all distractions, no food, no drink, no relations with our spouse. What happens? Every single day, you get angry, you start backbiting, you get frustrated. The only thing you can think about is food. The only thing you can think about is coffee. The only thing you can think about is drink. What happened? The whole idea is to marginalize distraction, and over here the only thing that is consum consuming us is the distraction into itself. So we say that during the days, during the month of Ramadan, we're supposed to dedicate it toward God and worship in the same way that we do the nights when we've broken our fast. But there's no worshiping during the day, man. We'll save that for night. But then the meal comes in front of us. And then we eat, and we eat, and we eat to our fill. And thus, we cannot even think about God. Because our bodies are so consumed with food. So when we talk about the idea that God wants for the individual, that we're really a wholesome creation. Not only again, that on one side, yes, that we want to prioritize our spiritual health, 
But there's a lot of other facets within the course of our life that we also need to recognize as really important. One's physical health, for instance. One's physical health is important. Numerous traditions from the Prophet and his family, peace and blessings be upon them, they tell us about the importance of maintaining one's physical health, about the importance of diet, about the importance of exercise, so on and so forth. You can go and take a look at the traditions of Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, that speak toward this idea and you speak toward this notion. You know over here, we're sitting here during Muharram, and we're here to recollect the tragedy of Hussein ibn Ali ibn Abi Talib. This man who, was, who died during the course of battle, you think those guys who were in battle with him, they didn't like work out a little bit? You think they didn't eat healthy? We talk about a figure like Abil Fadl al-Abbas. Like how do you picture him, man? I picture his biceps the size of my face. <laughs> These guys are legends. And when we read their anecdotes, and we read their stories, that he did this and he did that, and he fought like this during the course of that battle, what do you think? He just prayed the night prayer and all of a sudden his muscles became this size? <laughs> no, it also required an effort, a physical effort. And that's what it's about. Understanding that there is a semblance of physical health that is maintained within our tradition as well. We talk about mental health and we've done this many times in the past. The importance of understanding that our spiritual health and our physical health and so on and so forth, all is a mechanism to also contributing toward the success of our mental health. Where today we see how many people they struggle with challenges like that of anxiety and depression. And again, it's important that we prioritize that. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He states that it's important that you take care of your religious spiritual health, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, it's important that you take care of your physical bodies. In the same way that it's important that you take care of your mental health, in the same way that it's important you take care of your financial health, it's important to make sure that you get money and you say, oh, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me as wealth. And now let me give all of it in charity. To the extent where my wife and my kids, or my husband and my children, or my parents, or all of those who I'm responsible for, they're going to all suffer. That's not what it's about. It's about understanding that there has to be a sense of balance. I'm not saying that we're trying to raise $100,000 and trying to put you all into poverty, man. That's not what I'm saying. You give what you can, and that's what's going to make a difference. That's why I'm not saying that you need to give everything in your savings account for these programs. I'm saying you give and you understand the intention of the giving, and you'll see the unique blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you back. Istanzalu rizqi bis sadaqat that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase your wealth when you give in charity, for instance. And for today's discussion, inshallah, I want to talk about one of these phases and one of these facets of the health that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prioritizes for us within the whole Qur'an and within the hadith literature of the Prophet and his immaculate family, peace and blessings be upon them. These days we talk so much about food because everybody loves food. And it, food is such a central part of who we are as a human being. But it's important to understand that food has a mechanism for our own growth in terms of, in, in terms of allowing for us to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today, anyone and everyone is looking for the new diet that comes out that's going to transform their body in six weeks, or in eight weeks, or in 12 weeks. Everyone is looking for a quick fix. But what we learn from the traditions of the Prophet and his family, والسلام, like your spiritual health, like your financial health, like your mental health, your physical health is also going to be something that's a process, that's going to take time. You can't all of a sudden begin to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by coming to a couple of gatherings of these majadis for Imam al Hussein والسلام, and all of a sudden all of your faith is restored. What we try to do over here is that we try to offer a sense of inspiration. Over the last couple of nights, people have come to me and they said, Hey, why don't you talk about this? Yesterday you talked about jinn. When's the lecture about black magic? <laughs> I was like, okay, let's talk about something that's a little bit more important than all of these topics, first of all, right? Let's talk about your prayers. They're like, no, no, no. We want something trendy. We want something cool. And anyway, none of your lecture made any sense from last night because my grandmother told me that the jinns eat our lunch. No, no, no. That was your older brother who ate your lunch. Anyhow, what I'm trying to say is that everyone, 
is always looking for something unique. They're looking for something that's so abstract. But at the end of the day, what the religion of Islam teaches us is to really engage in really practical things. And going back to the example that I was going to give, that what we try to offer is a sense of inspiration. So you go back and you take the inspiration that you gain, inshallah, and you go and you do your own research. And you go and you open up a book. And you go and you research and you watch other lectures. And you go and you allow for your own self-study to take place. Because you can't gain all of spirituality during the course of ten nights in their entirety. That's not what religion is all about. It's a process that starts from our infancy and we go through many unique phases during the course of our life. A lot of highs and a lot of lows, a lot of ups and a lot of downs, a lot of moments when we feel the presence of our Creator and a lot of moments when we just don't feel anything at all. Which is why Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali alayhi salatu wa salam, he states, Inna lil-qulubi iqbalan wa idbara That surely of these hearts, sometimes they're receptive and sometimes they are distancing. In the moments when your heart is feeling like it's up for it, when you wake up in the middle of the night because your daughter kicked you in the face, as I gave the example before, go and open up the Qur'an. You can't sleep. Go and say some prayers. Maybe God wants to hear your voice. Don't you lose those opportunities. Your heart wants something more. All of a sudden you feel extra motivation, you feel extra inspiration to recite Qur'an, to make supplication, to do whatever it is that you got to do, then go and you do that to fulfill that spiritual dimension of your body or of your being. And sometimes you don't feel that way. So then all you have to do is just perform the obligations and don't do anything forbidden. Just pray. And that's it. You don't have to recite the adhkar, you don't have to recite the du'a, you don't have to recite the adhan and the aqama. Not that I'm encouraging that we often don't do these things, because when we see that it's something that we are continuously doing, and we're con continuously distancing ourselves from spirituality, then we need to get worried. Then we need to fear and have a real diagnosis of where my heart or my soul is at. And our bodies are the same way. It's okay once in a while to eat a donut. It's okay once in a while to eat those cookies that our brother Ali donated outside. Suggested donation, $2 goes to supporting our programming. <laughs> once in a while it's okay. But when you see yourself consuming it and consuming it and consuming it and consuming it, and you're like, oh man, it's okay, because at least I'm praying. At least I'm fasting during the month of Ramadan. It's about understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants holistic balance from our lives in their entirety. Which is why I want to focus our discussion for this evening, inshallah, in three dimensions. The first dimension is in terms of understanding the relationship between the body and the soul of the human being. The second dimension is in terms of understanding healthy eating and exercise within Islamic tradition. And thirdly and finally, for us to reflect upon traditions in terms of food etiquette as taught to us by the Prophet and his family, Peace and blessings be upon them. As for our first dimension, what is the relationship between the body and the soul when we talk about the human being? The human being comprises of two really important dimensions. That of the physical and that of the spiritual. And it's impossible for us to ever divorce one from the other. We are a physical being, as I mentioned last night, that is made out of dust, that is made out of clay, that is made out of this earth. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, with the, created us with the light within us that is more luminous than anything that we could ever imagine. And with that light that is within us, with that soul, or with that ruh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to within the whole of Qur'an, we have really incredible potentials. But it's always important for us to understand that we cannot prioritize one over the other. There has to be a sense of balance. And for many people, they understand that. It's obvious. Why would we ever want to prioritize our bodies over our souls? The most important thing to me is my faith. The most important thing to me is God. The most important thing to me is the cultivation of my own spirituality. Because I'm only going to live in this world for 70 years, or 80 years, or 50 years, or 150 years. But at the end of the day, there's a life that's eternal after this one. And my mind always has to be fixated on the world beyond this one. But at the end of the day, we're still a human being, aren't we? We're still a creation that likes nice things. We like things that are shiny. We like things that are attractive. 
We like food that tastes good. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this about the human being. He states within the whole of Quran, in chapter 3, verse number 14, زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّحَوَاتِ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ وَالْبَنِينَ وَقَنَاطِيرَ الْمُقَنْتَرَةٍ مِنَ الظَّهَبِ وَالْفِذَّةِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that زُيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ حُبُّ الشَّحَوَاتِ That He has fashioned within the human being the love of certain desires. That He has given us the desire, and He states it very clearly, the desire to love wealth to love gold, to love silver, to love diamonds, to love all of those nice shiny things. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has fashioned our hearts and our souls to be innately attractive to the face of Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> and what an attractive face he has. Subhanallah. God has fashioned us to love property, to love things, to love wealth, and he continues, and to love cattle, and to love sex, and to love all of these things. He doesn't say that they're bad. He says, that's the way that we created the human being. I mean, God knows it. So someone says, but then God says that He knows that this is what we love and He fashioned us with these things. Why does He say they're not permissible? Or why does He say that it's, too much, it's, it's not good for us to consume too much of any of these things? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, and make sure you don't allow for yourself to understand that this life is the only life. A man, he comes to Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. He comes to the great grandson of the Messenger of God and he states, Oh grandson of the Messenger of God, he said, I have a problem. Every one of us, we have the same problem. But we don't admit it. He says, Oh grandson of the Messenger of God, I have a problem. He says, what can I do for you? He says, I love wealth. I love money. I love my property. I love my big home. I love my cattle. We have cars and we have other things. He says, I love all of my property. I love everything that I have. And he says, I would like to accumulate more. He says, help me, because I know that this is a spiritual disease. Muhammad Sadiq alayhi salam, he tells him, he says, why is it that you love those things? He says, I'm comfortable. My family's comfortable. My children are comfortable. And he said, I like to go and I like to travel. I like to see things. I like to go places. He said, I like to go for Hajj, and I like to go toward the ziyarah, to the visitation of your grandfathers. I like to give also. I like all of these things. The Imam Ali salam says, then your love of this dunya is worship. Not love of this dunya that is so attractive that it consumes our life. But if you understand that this is just a stepping stone for you to get toward the next stage, then it's okay. Which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say you should not eat good food. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say you should not make money. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say you should not exercise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't tell us any of these things. Where does He say any of these things? He says the moment is when your life is consumed with these things. So to understand that the human being is a body and is a soul, is a spiritual and is a physical. Which is why in the dua we say, رَبَّنَا أَعْتِنَا فِي الدُّنْيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ Hasana. Oh Allah, give me goodness in this world and give me goodness in the next. We want the best of both worlds. That's okay. As again, as long as we are in a state of understanding that we cannot allow for ourselves to be consumed with this world, again, that is filled with just so many distractions. And again, in terms of understanding this relationship between the body and the soul, when the body understands that everything that it needs is solely a mechanism for a stepping stone to go and move on to the next world, then everything gets into context. Why is it that you want to attain wealth? Why is it that you want to allow for the health of your physical body? Why is it that you want to eat? Why do we eat? Some people, they enjoy food, eating food because it's delicious and they can't stop themselves from eating food. But at the end of the day, the purpose of eating food is what? Is to sustain ourselves so we can go and fulfill the responsibilities of life that we have. To go and work so we can provide for our families or provide for ourselves. So we can live another day. And all of a sudden, food is not that attractive anymore, is it? It's just a means toward getting to an end. But for most people, we see food as the end in and of itself. 
I'm going to make money so I can go out and eat. No, 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 that's not what it's all about. I'm going to live this life so I can travel to every country in the world so I can go and try their most unique delicacies. Great, go ahead and do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't say that you should not eat nice foods. But about understanding that us as a human being have to recognize that it has to be a means to an end. The end and the objective of everything is our Creator. Which is why we're taught within our tradition the importance and the significance of fasting. We're told to fast on Mondays and on Thursdays, for instance, if possible. You fast on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of every lunar month. We fast during the course of the month of Ramadan as an obligation. All of these fasts that we have, we have other traditions that state the one who fasts during, every day during the month of Rajab, they get this reward. Everyone who fasts every day during the month of um, Sha'ban, they receive this reward. Those who fast the first nine days of Muharram, they receive this reward. Those who fast the first nine days of the month of the Hijjah, they receive this reward. Why? In order to offer us a sense of incentive that sometimes when you recognize that our bodies are a little bit less important than our spiritual dimension, then there's an opportunity for that soul to be illuminated by the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it's about. Everyone following what I'm saying or no? We go for Hajj. Many of us again, we just went for Hajj. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all that opportunity next year and every year inshallah. And I'll say this, and I'm going to say it again later on. I really encourage you all that if you have the opportunity, you have the financial well-being to go and performing the Hajj pilgrimage, next year come with me, we'll have an amazing time inshallah. I promise you, and I'm not just saying that because it's me and I'm an amazing person, <laughs> but because you are going to just be with such an amazing person, you'll have an amazing time, inshallah. <laughs> Zahir, any thoughts? No, no thoughts, not during Muharram. We don't make any jokes. So, when we talk about going for Hajj, Hajj is physically exhausting. Not only do we spend out of our wealth, again, Hajj is expensive. How much is Hajj this past year? Between eight and $12,000. Someone says, oh my goodness, how can I spend that type of money? Maybe sometimes even more expensive. Just a lot of money. Someone says, why should I spend that much money? Don't worry about why. Understanding the ultimate objective is that your wealth is less important than seeking the sense of closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's physically exhausting and taxing. Which is why if you're younger, and mashallah, every one of you are young, you're younger than you are going to be tomorrow, so try to register for the Hajj trip when we start releasing the information about it, inshallah. You go and you see that it's physically exhausting and tiring. You have to walk around the Holy Kaaba. You have to walk from this town, from this city to this city. You have, there's a, just a lot of sort of exhaustion during the course. A limited sleep and so on and so forth. Why? Because the tiring of your body, again, allows for that soul to be illuminated. Most people, they say, I don't feel a sense of connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for instance, with the exception of the 30 days during the month of Ramadan. Or when we come to these gatherings in, we, in which we recollect the merits of the Prophet and his family, alayhi wa So we have 40 days in which we reinvigorate our hearts and our souls. Every single one of us are super busy during the course of these days. Because we're coming for the gatherings here at night, then tomorrow morning we're going to go to work. And tomorrow morning is my daughter's first day of school. Make the offer her, inshallah. I'm so nervous right now. <laughs> we all have a lot of things that are going on in our lives, but how can we feel a sense of more connectivity to God, even though that we've spent out of our wealth? Even though that we are physically exhausted? Even though that our bodies have not slept properly in the last five or six nights? Because our souls are being illuminated. They're being filled with the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what it's about. So understand that we have a body and that we have a soul. And through exerting our body, our soul will be able to be filled with all of those unique qualities that we're aspiring to attain and that we're aspiring to reach. And then that brings me toward the second dimension of my discussion. About the body within Islamic tradition. We talk about exercise, we talk about food, we talk about wellness as a human being. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us very strict and deliberate instructions in regards to what every single one of these physical or organs have been for, or have been created for. When we talk about exercise, I don't only mean running and going to the gym and lifting weights, but exercising one's body also means, for instance, fasting during the month of Ramadan. It exercises your stomach to making sure that it's not eating as much as it normally would. 
امام زین العابدین علیہ السلام اللہ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم و آلہ وسلم In his famous work, The Treaties of Rights, Rasadat al-Hukuq, he comes and he lists one by one the rights of your body parts over you. He states, for instance, the right over your tongue over the human being is that you consider it too obscene to speak foul language. You recognize that your tongue is so honored in the eyes of God that you will never not only speak ill of someone else, that you will never curse. You know, cursing is something really disgusting, man. And I don't mean to call anyone out. Just like, why do we use bad language all the time? Like about everything, like even for no reason. This bleep water bottle, why? Like what, why, would you, why can't you just say this water bottle? This bleeping sheikh. <laughs> What's wrong with this guy? Why can't you say this sheikh? Why do we need to always use bad language? That the tongue is so honored in the eyes of God that we consider any bad language too obscene for it. So what do we have to do? We have to exercise the tongue. We have to exercise the tongue from using bad language. So we restrict ourselves. Once in a while it's going to come out by mistake, but then you catch yourself and you say, okay, wait a minute, I'm going to put that back in my mouth. I'm going to wash my mouth with soap and all of those sorts of things. So it's again about understanding that our body parts have a right over us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, for instance, that the right of your tongue is that it's too obscene to speak bad language. He states that the right of your eye, according to a tradition also from Muhammad Qadim alayhi salam, the right of the eye over the human being is to recognize that everything that it sees contains a lesson. Meaning you cultivate even your eyes to recognize that everything that I see when I'm walking in the streets is supposed to be a means, again, which is taking me toward a destination. What's the purpose of a lesson? The lesson is supposed to teach you something, meaning every single day when I open my eyes, I'm supposed to learn. And every day when I learn, what's the ultimate objective? I'm supposed to grow, grow intellectually, grow emotionally, grow socially, grow within all of the phases and facets of life because that's what God gave you the eye for. Imam Zainal Abidin, he continues and he states, the right of the ear, what is the right of the ear over a human being? That you only listen to that which is going to be beneficial for you. How many hours and days and moments do we sit in gatherings by listening to things which are going to be so completely insignificant for your self-development? How many podcasts that we listen to are a waste of time, which is why I say, follow Shaykh and get up with Shaykh Fayyaz. <laughs> you already listened to the Ramadan podcast? Listen to it again, no worries. It's a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> We'll upload our Muharram lectures as well. I'm sorry, I need to stop doing this. I'm not a good guy, my podcasts suck. I know, I'm just lying. Come on. I'm a great guy, my podcasts are awesome. How many hours and moments of the day do we listen to things that are not beneficial for these ears of ours? And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, and the right of the stomach over you is that you'd never fill it to its full capacity. Allahu Akbar. <laughs> the right of the stomach over the human being is that you never fill it to its full capacity. Why? Because what's the purpose of eating again? And I'm not saying this to lecture anyone else, as I've been mentioning the last several nights. The only one who benefits from these gatherings is myself more than anyone else. And I'm talking to myself before I'm talking to anyone else that how many times do I fill my stomach to its full capacity whereby I cannot focus on anything except for why did I eat so much and I promise I won't do the same thing tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes. And Allahu Akbar, tomorrow comes and the day after that comes. And we continuously allow for this act of transgression, of sin, of vice to overcome ourselves. A man one day, a man by the name of Unwan al Basri in a really lengthy hadith, he goes toward Imam al Sadiq alayhi salatu wasalam. And he says, Oh, grandson of the Messenger of God, I need your help. He says, I need you to give me spiritual insights. I need you to teach me how I can connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Give me the skills and give me the secrets of what is known as riyadh to nafs. Within Islamic traditions, classical scholars of Islamic ethics and so on, they've emphasized the science known as riyadh to nafs, which is what? Which is literally translated as the exercise of the soul, 
or another word which is spirituality or ethics or whatever it might be. But tr literally as translated as the exercise of the soul. He says, I want you to give me insight in terms of how I can reach the highest level in relationship with my Creator. Many times people reach out to me or they go online and they Google it. And they say, how can I know God? How can I feel the presence of God? The same way that I felt it during the nights of Ashura. The same way that I felt it during the nights of Ramadan. The same way that I felt the presence of God in front of the Holy Kaaba, in front of the shrine of Imam al Hussein, salamullah alayhi, next to the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. I want to feel that feeling. We want to go back to it. That moment of emotion, that moment of you know, spiritual illumination, something really profound and something really beautiful. We call it the khushu, sense of understanding, mindfulness. We'll talk about more about that tomorrow, inshallah. This man, he comes to Imam al-Sadiq with virtually that same question. And the Imam, salam Allah alayhi, he says, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. And I want everyone to understand what these three pieces of advice are. He states, number one, the first piece of advice, if you want to be someone who trains your soul and allows for self-discipline to overcome you, whereby you only feel the presence of God, that do not eat that which you don't have an appetite for. Do not eat that which you don't have an appetite for. Where's the du'a? Where's the writing Qur'an backwards, putting it in your pocket? What does he say? He didn't say recite du'a kumar for 40 consecutive days. Recite ziyarat ashura for 40 consecutive years. Those are all good things, don't get me wrong. He says, number one, don't eat that which you don't have an appetite for. Number two, in terms of cultivating your soul so that you're able to reach the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do not eat unless you're hungry. Two out of the three advices about food. How many times do we eat when we're not hungry? How many times do we eat when we're not hungry? I give this example a lot during the month of Ramadan, but it's so pertinent right now. At the end of the night, we're approaching suhoor. Seven minutes left before Fajr prayers. You're already full. But that gallon of water, <laughs> that water I'm going to need it 19 hours from now. <laughs> so you take the water, you drink the whole thing. You literally have water falling all over your face. It's like, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Don't eat if you don't want to. Don't eat, I'm talking to myself. If you're not hungry, don't eat things that you don't want to eat. Someone says, but the guest offered it to me. They said it's tabarruk. They said it's niyaz, like we have within our culture during the days of these gatherings for the Prophet and his family, people, they make food and they distribute food as a sense of respect. And they say, if you eat this food, it's, it's going to cure all of your illnesses. It's like, well, I have high cholesterol, man. This donut is not going to help me right now. But like, no, 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 this donut because it's for Prophet and his family, no. This donut is actually going to cure your high cholesterol. What are we talking about? Is that what Allah subhanahu That's what God wants from us? No, no, but it's for the program. No, 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 no. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the divine instruction of the Prophet and his family, salam, don't eat that which you don't have an appetite for. Number two, don't eat except when you're hungry. And number three, he states, only eat that which is halal, Begin in the name of God, say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And every time you eat, remember the tradition in which the Prophet ﷺ states that there is no vessel that man fills worse than his stomach. Imagine every time you stand in front of food, like you take, I don't know, you just like have like a business card or some index card, you take it out and put it in front of your meal. There is no vessel that man fills worse than his stomach. How could you ever eat anything? That's the words of your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Every time we eat, there is no vessel that man fills worse than his stomach. All of a sudden, where's our mind going to be? Where's our heart going to be? Where's our soul going to be? All three advices that Imam al-Sadiq says about how to train your soul have to do with what it is that we eat. Which is why this is not something that is just a simple conversation. It's not something that where I just run by a couple of ahadith. It's something that we really need to go back home with and like think about for ourselves as individuals. And understanding that along with eating and eating that which is right, it's also important to eat that which is healthy. 
It doesn't make any sense to not do that if we're understanding that the purpose of food is to take us toward the next stage, to take us toward the next step, is to take us toward our ultimate objective. And that brings me toward the third dimension of my discussion. And that is in regards toward food etiquette, as described by the Prophet and his family, alayhim salatu salam. But before it, before I get into that, let me leave you with this one tradition from the commander of the faithful, Imam Ali alayhi salatu salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He states that there is nothing that someone eats, nor anything that someone drinks, except that God will question him or her on the day of judgment of why they ate it. That's a lot to handle. If you just think about everything that you ate in the last two hours, God's going to ask, why did you take that extra coffee when you didn't need it? Why did you take that extra bite when you didn't want to eat it? One by one, we think about, again, how much our bodies and how much our lives are filled with just consumption and consumption and consumption, again, to the extent that we isolate the other dimension. And this is the point that I want to get to. Everyone, because we're a people of faith and we're a people of religion and we're a people who care about our spirituality and we're people who care about our soul, otherwise we wouldn't be here tonight. Every one of us, we know that our souls are way more important than our bodies. Every one of us know that. But how come we consume and we allow for our bodies to be filled to its full capacity, but we don't do the same with our souls? There's a tradition in which the Messenger وسلم, he states that there are two vessels of the human being which always continue to expand and that never get filled. Number one is the stomach and number two is the intellect. Which one of those do we want to fill to full capacity and allow for it to continue to expand? We don't want our stomachs to expand. It's not good. What we want is for our intellects to expand. We want our souls to expand. We want to be illuminated by the light of the Qur'an, by the light of the Prophet and his traditions. That's what this is all about. We come toward these gatherings again to seek a sense of inspiration that's transformative for our hearts, for our souls. But when our bodies are so filled, our souls, they begin to decrease. And we have traditions that speak toward this, not directly in the way that I'm saying, but indirectly they point toward this notion. That when you continue to fill your body, with all of those things, not only food, but wealth, and with sex, and with sleep, and with everything other than that which is godly, and everything which is taking us away from understanding that this life is temporary, then at the end of the day, the only thing that's failing is that spiritual dimension of ours. So again, the commander of the faithful, he states, Imam Ali alayhi salam, that everything that we eat and everything that we drink is going to be, we are going to be questioned for it on Judgment Day. So I wanted to reflect a little bit in regards to some of the etiquettes of the way that the Prophet ﷺ used to eat as mentioned within our ahadith. So a couple of hadiths that I want to just run through very, very quickly. And the idea again that when we enter into the state of our meal, again, we allow for God to be back in the equation. And I'm not saying that every single time before you eat, you literally have to say that there is no stomach that God fills, that the human being fills worse than his stomach, right? There's no vessel that the human being fills worse than his stomach, not every single time. But you want to cultivate yourself and ourselves to the extent that we're able, to, again, to be in a state of real mindset before it is that we're engaging in what it is that we're eating. So some etiquettes that are mentioned within Islamic tradition, number one, is that before we eat, we should wash our hands. Obvious. We should go before we eat, and you wash your hands. I tell my daughter, go before you eat, wash your hands. She says, why? We're going to eat with a spoon. She's right. Back in the day, they used to eat with their hands, right? They used to eat with their hands. And over here, we actually find within our hadith that it's a recommendation to eat with your hands. And the hadith that actually states that one who washes their hands and goes directly into their meal, eating with their hands, meaning that they don't dry their hands, they eat with wet hands, they've brought in a unique blessing to the food that they're about to eat, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will put blessing in their meal. Try that tomorrow. <laughs> 
Another tradition states about the importance of performing wudu, the ablution, before one's meal. Someone says why? Again, it puts us in a mindset that what we're doing, anything and everything that we're doing, is for God's sake. In a hadith, it states that the one who performs wudu, listen to this for all my friends going through financial difficulties and so on and so forth. Hadith states that the one who performs wudu before his meal or her meal and after their meal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will increase their wealth. Before and after every meal, perform wudu. And second, a third tradition that states that when you're eating, one should sit on the floor. Not only eat with one's hands, but eat on the floor as we do communally over here. Right? It's something unique, something in many traditional cultures we do, but actually the Prophet ﷺ says it's beneficial for one's health as well. And I'm sure where my doctor is in the room, you know, maybe they can speak to that point. My nutritionists, is that true? Not true, maybe, you don't know? <laughs> Come on, man. Number three, before one eats, before someone enters into their meal, they should begin in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And after they eat, they say Alhamdulillah. Again, for, to put ourselves in a very, a very sort of basic mindset. If every time before I eat, I say in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful, then I know that the blessing of that food is from where? Except for God. And after I eat, I say, Alhamdulillah, all thanks and all praise is due to God. All of a sudden, again, I know that God has given me this food. And God states within the whole of Quran, La in shakartum, la azidannakum. That if you thank me, I'm going to give you more. And we love more. And we love more. And we love more. So God says, Thank me, and I will give you more. There's a famous anecdote in which it states that one day, Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi salatu wasalam, the messenger of God, Abraham, one day he was walking in the streets. And he could not find anyone who was able to share his dinner with him. It was the etiquette and the character of Prophet Ibrahim that he would never eat any meal without sharing it with someone. Because amongst the etiquettes of eating is that you eat with other people as well. It's not good to eat alone. If you traditionally eat alone, invite me for dinner, no worries. <laughs> Anytime. I'll meet you. Anywhere in the city. Like steak like other nice foods, you guys don't like my joke, okay. Fine. <laughs> too many jokes, too many jokes. Somebody told me, Sheikh Muharram, too many jokes. You need to stop. I'm gonna stop, inshallah. You don't want me to stop. <laughs> Prophet Ibrahim is he's walking in the streets looking for someone to share his meal with. Finally, he's walking and he sees a man, and he says, oh man, come, come and share dinner with me. You guys are like, okay, free food. He comes into the house of Abraham alayhi salam, he sits down at the, on the floor because they're about to eat where the food is being served and Ibrahim salam says, my dear friend, what's your name? He gives him his name. He said, before we begin, let's begin in the name of God, the most compassionate, the most merciful. Let's say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's say, oh God, thank you for giving me this meal. The guy said, nope, I'm not doing that. He said, why not? He said, I don't believe in God. He said, don't force me to do anything. I'm going to let me eat or no. Ibrahim salam says, you don't believe in God, get out. I'm going to go find somebody else. He gets up and he leaves. Prophet Ibrahim is walking in the streets, looking for someone else. And Jibra'il, the angel Gabriel, comes down from the skies. And he says, oh Ibrahim, what did you do? He says, what do you mean? He said, I invited that man to come and eat with me. He said, but he wouldn't begin in the name of God. He didn't thank God for the food that was in front of him. To which the angel he responds toward Ibrahim. He said, Oh Abraham, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, He told me, I was next to His throne just a few moments ago, and He told me that I used to sustain that man for 55 years and He never even knew that I existed. Who are you to tell him that he should not eat your food? Meaning what? That every single day, whether we recognize God or whether we don't recognize God, that's a blessing of God that is in front of us. But all we have to do is be in a state of mindset that it comes from Him, and all of a sudden we will see such unique blessing that will come even in the food that we eat. To be in a, being in a state of thanking God, beginning in His name, after it, being in a state of recognition, all of these things, they place an imprint on our souls. Again, understanding that that which we state from the tongue, that which our physical bodies overcome, they all imprint within the spiritual dimension of ours. Furthermore, a couple of traditions that speak to the importance of how one should eat. How, sh how did the Prophet ﷺ eat? What did he used to eat? Many people, they ask the question. One of the traditions tell us 
That the Prophet ﷺ and Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them, they used to love sweets, man. Every one of us, we love sweets. Who doesn't love sweets? In fact, a hadith from Imam Sadiq salam states, Men ishtaddalana hubban, ishtadda hubban lihalwiyat. It states that the one who has intense love of the Prophet and his family, they also have intense love of sweet things. This is why I love those cookies. Two dollar suggested donations outside. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay to love sweets. There's nothing wrong with it. They loved it as well. And when you love sweet things, that means you love the Prophet of God. What a blessing. But it doesn't mean that you eat it all the time. You just love it from afar. And you say, oh Allah in paradise, give me all the donuts. <laughs> Amongst the things that the Prophet ﷺ used to eat very regularly was that he used to eat barley with whole wheat grain bread, for instance. Right? You can get that at Trader Joe's, Whole Foods. <laughs> okay, I'll stop guys. I'll really, I'll stop now. <laughs> Amongst the things that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, as I mentioned earlier, was that he would always make sure to make his best effort toward eating with others toward inviting others, toward creating a space that's welcoming. Really, there's a lot of relationships that are built over just sharing a meal with one another. And I'll conclude with this last point. And there's really a lot more to talk about in terms of specific foods that the Prophet ﷺ would normally eat. Someone says, when would the Prophet eat before I get into this last point? When would the Prophet ﷺ eat? Well, how many meals did he used to eat a day? Sometimes these days people say you should eat three meals. Sometimes they say you should eat five small meals. Sometimes they say you should eat seven smaller meals. Tomorrow, someone's going to say you should eat 11 mini meals. Right? Every day there's something else. Right? When did the Prophet eat? You go and you see the traditions. One day a man, he comes to Imam Sadiq. He said, oh grandson of the Messenger of God, when did your grandfather used to eat? He responds with a very simple line, when he was hungry. <laughs> you eat when you're hungry. That's it. The Prophet ﷺ, he used to enjoy eating meat, but he would always say, make sure that the meat that we eat is also in moderation. In a tradition that's attributed to Ali ibn Abi Talib ﷺ, it states, do not make your stomachs the home or the graveyard of animals. Meaning, how much animal are we going to consume in this body of ours, right? There are other benefits and blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, and God has told us, kulu washrabu that eat and drink mimma razaqnakum from what that which we have sustained you with that which we have given you it's okay to eat it's okay to enjoy it's also okay for sometimes to allow for yourselves to indulge in things that are unique as even the prophet and even ahlul bayt alayhim salatu wasalam used to it's fine it's no problem but as long as you understand that there are a means toward getting to an end and that everything that we consume with our body has to be in a state of understanding that it's a means, again, a mechanism to fuel our soul and to allow for its illumination of that which is comprised of all of the unique values that our faith and that our religion calls to. And again, to conclude with this point, that the Prophet ﷺ used to make every single effort and every opportunity to make sure that he ate with others. He spent time with others. Even if he didn't know them, he would be eating on the floor in the masjid. And if someone came, he would come and tell them, sit with me, eat with me, eat a little bit of my food, share with me, converse with me. And that's what life and community and religion is all about. Because those moments become moments of blessing and moments of reward and moments by which they were exposed toward the light of the Prophet of God Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It was their character that was so attractive and their etiquette and the beauty Make sure that we are doing our best to emanate those same things. I say this every year for those of you who have been here the last several years during Muharram. We are now in the fifth night of these gatherings. How many of you have spoken to the people that you traditionally sit next to? Many of you sit in the same seats or in the same areas where you have been sitting for the last five nights. Did you introduce yourself to the person to your right, to your left? But that's what it's all about. You go and you create a space that's welcoming for other people. You greet them, you eat with them, tell them that I didn't see you for dinner yesterday or today. Why don't you come and eat tomorrow? We have dinner at 7 o'clock. Is everything okay with you and your family if you haven't seen them in a long time? I haven't seen you since last Muharram. Is everything alright? It's okay to ask these questions. Why are we shy? I don't know. I don't know why. That's not what the Prophet ﷺ and Ahlul Bayt ﷺ used to cultivate. 
they cultivated an opportunity where these blessings that God had given us, even by food and drink, was an entry point for people. And that's what's so beautiful, again, about this tradition. And this tradition of food as well. With that, if I can ask you to recite one salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. <laughs> But today we are here on the night of the 5th of this month of Muharram. And we are five nights away from the night of tragedy which we cannot compare. The tragedy of our master Hussein ibn Ali. Peace and blessings be upon him. And as we are here over the last 45 minutes talking about food and drink, I tell you my dear friends, How's the longest you've ever been without food and drink? When you're fasting during the month of Ramadan, 18 hours, and it's so hard, and it's so difficult, and it's so challenging. And for many of us, we have to go to work, and we have to go to school, and we have to fulfill all of these responsibilities during the course of that fast. And we get a little bit of a feeling of people who don't have food and people who don't have a drink. In a hadith it says that fasting should also be a means by which we humble ourselves to give food and drink to those who don't have any. But these nights are an opportunity at the same time for us to remember that our master Hussein, on that tenth of Muharram, he was hungry and he was thirsty. For three days, the women and the children and the companions and the friends of Hussein ibn Ali did not have food, nor did they have any drink. To the extent that one by one those children would go toward their father, they would go toward their uncle, they would go toward their aunt and say, we are dying of thirst. And the army of Amr ibn Sa'ad had taken the river Euphrates and held it hostage for themselves as they watched the weeping and the grieving of these women and of these children and of these men who had dedicated so much toward their stance of justice and of generosity and of beauty and of love and of mercy. And traditionally on this night, the night of the 5th of Muharram, we recollect some of the companions of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam who offered their life and ransom of the grandson of the Messenger of God. And these companions of Imam al-Hussein, peace and blessings be upon them, they are so incredible. To the extent that the Imam alayhi salam, he states, Inni la a'lam, inni la a'rif ashabi awfa wa khayran min ashabi, that I don't know any companions who are as loyal and who are better than my companions. Because every time the Imam alayhi salam asked them to do anything, they were ready to be at the service of their master. And one by one on the 10th of Muharram, they go and they pledge their allegiance to Sayyid al-Shahada Abi Abdullah al-Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam before they go out and they are valiantly killed. And the Imam alayhi salam, out of the beauty of his character, would treat every single one of them in the same way that he would treat his own son. There was a man by the name of John, this great companion of the Imam alayhi salam. He comes toward him and he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, allow for me to give my life in your way. This man, in his earlier in his life, he was a slave of Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, one of the companions of the Prophet of God. And he was inherited by the family of the Prophet. Imam al Hussein freed him and allowed for him to be amongst his companions and amongst his supporters on the day of Ashura during the course of this epic battle. He states, oh my master, let me go and fight, let me defend your women, let me defend your children, let me defend you, you are the grandson of the messenger of God. He states, go. He states that he goes and he fights valiantly until he falls down from his horse and he calls out, As-salamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah, peace be upon you, O Hussein. These are my last moments. To which Hussein, he leaves the horse, he leaves the tent and he rushes toward this companion and he falls down from the ground. And he takes the head of John, he places it in his lap. Then he takes his cheek and he places it on the cheek of John. And he only did this one other time on the day of Ashura. He places his cheek as a sense of consolement, as a sense of love, as a sense of saying, don't worry, I'm with you at this moment. 
like we might do to our child. The only other time that Imam al Hussein does that is a few moments later when his son Ali al Akbar falls down from the horse. To a Jean, he looks up and he sees the eyes of the son of Ali and the son of Fatima, and he states, Haddi ala had ibn bint Rasulullah min mithli. He states that my cheek is resting on the cheek of the son of the daughter of the Prophet of God, who is like me. What blessing do I have at this moment? And a few moments later, he passes away. One by one, you find companions like that of Muslim ibn Awsaja, who was also a companion of the Prophet salam, meaning he's very elderly during this day. He goes out and he fights valiantly until he has killed himself. Abbas ibn Shabib, one by one, they go and they fight until they are killed. And we'll talk a little bit more about every one of these companions and what they offered to Imam al Hussein on the night of Ashura. But tonight on the 5th of Muharram, the night of the 5th of Muharram, traditionally, ritualistically, we remember the leader of the companions, the most unique from amongst all of them, a man who was filled with such charisma, with such intense love of the Prophet and his family, a man who was so connected with God, a man who if you have been to the city of Karbara, you know there's a unique place where he is buried. In front of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, that man is Habib ibn Mabahir al Asadi. For those of you who have been to Karbara, you know that before you enter into the shrine of Imam al Hussein, before you enter on the left hand side, you see the grave of Habib ibn Mabahir. And as you're leaving, you also have to go and send your salutation on the right hand side to Habib ibn Mabahir al Asadi. What a man that this individual was. Habib ibn Mabahir is a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And it is stated that on the day of Ashura, on the 10th of Muharram, during the course of that epic battle, where he was in his older age, he was so old that he had wrinkles on his face, that when he was riding on the horse or when he was running, he needed to tie a, a, a tissue or a piece of cloth so that the skin on his forehead would not overcome his eyes. But yet, he was ready to come to the support of Hussein. And it is stated that when Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he reaches the city of Karbara, as we mentioned a couple of nights ago, that the objective was that Imam al Hussein alayhi salam he goes toward Kufa because that was his stronghold, that were where many of his companions were, that's where many people had written letters toward the Imam to come toward Habib ibn Mawahir, he lived in Kufa. And on the way from the path from when the Imam al Hussein he leaves Mecca to going toward Karbara, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam sends a letter toward his old friend Habib. And this letter reaches Habib ibn Mawahir one day. And he opens up this letter and he reads it. And as he's reading it, he, had, he sees tears, his wife sees tears flowing down from his eyes. And his wife comes toward him. They say, she says, Oh Habib. She says, why are you weeping like this? What is that in your hand? He said, this is a letter from the grandson of the Prophet of God. He is calling me to his service. His wife says, then what are you waiting for? Why are you sitting here? Get up and go. And he said that he tells his wife that the city of Kufa has been shut down. It's very difficult to escape. So he calls his servant and he says, oh my servant? He says, I want you to go toward the outskirts of the city of Kufa with my horse. Because if anyone from Banu Umayyah, they see me with my horse leaving the home, they're going to get suspicious. So you take the horse and you go toward the outskirts of Kufa, and once you and, and, and go toward the outskirts of Kufa, and I will find you at such and such location. He said, if I do not make it, you are free, take my horse and do as you please. He says, but if I make it, Wait for me and I will free you, I will give you some monetary gift, and you are free to go. He says, sure. He takes the horse of Habib ibn Madahar, they go toward the outskirts of Kufa, and that night Habib ibn Madahar al-Asadi, he leaves his home, and he escapes toward the outskirts of Kufa. And that man, he's looking up at the sky, that servant of his, he's looking up at the sky and he says, Habib is late. And he says, if he thought that I was going to just take this horse and go anywhere else except to the plains of Karbara so I can defend his master Hussein, then he did not know who I was. 
And at that moment, Habib appears behind him. He touches him on the back of the shoulder. He embraces him. He says, let's go toward the place of martyrdom. Let's go to the place of Hussein alayhi salam. It is said a few days later that he reaches the city of Kerbera. He comes down from his horse and he sees the camp that has already been set up. And he begins to walk closer and closer. And all of the companions, they look and they see that it's Habib the Mabahar, one of the companions of the Prophet of God. They begin to celebrate. They begin to embrace him, they begin to hug him, they begin to kiss him, and then they go and they rush toward Imam al Hussein, and they said, Oh Aba Abdullah, your old friend Habib is here. Imagine what it's like to see someone you haven't seen in such a long time, especially when you're going through such difficulty, when you're going through such trial, when you're going through such tribulation. Imam al Hussein is looking for someone to complain to, he's looking for someone to vent to. He sees his old friend Habib, he embraces him, he grieves a little bit, he says, Oh Habib, thank you for coming. He here is your flag, here is your armor, here is your sword. And then he says, Oh Habib, when the commotion was made that you had arrived, that my sister Zainab, she heard that you had come, and she sends you her salutations. At this moment, Habib ibn Mabahar, he falls down to the ground and he takes off his turban, and he places sand on top of his head, and he says, Man ana hatta tusallim alayya Zainab. He says, Who am I that Zainab, the granddaughter of the messenger, of God sends her salutations upon me. At that moment it is said that he gets up, he embraces the Imam alayhi salam, and on the 10th of Muharram there was no one that was as valuable as a sense of support to Imam al Hussein from amongst the companions as Habib ibn Mabahar. It is says that he comes toward the Imam and he says, Oh Aba Abdullah, Oh Imam al Hussein, give me permission. Do you give me permission to go and fight? He says, Oh my friend Habib, you're an elderly man. You were a friend of my grandfather Muhammad. You were a supporter of my father Ali. You were there with Hassan. Now you're going to leave and you're going to be martyred on this land. Don't go. Habib ibn Mabahar, he insists. He says, Oh Aba Abdullah, my life is in dedication to you and to your family. That's it. And he fights valiantly until he kills 62 people, until he makes the call and someone comes and he strikes him on top of the head, a man by the name of Hasin ibn Namir. He comes and he strikes Habib the Mabahar on the head. His, his, his helmet, it breaks and it creases a pierce in his head which allows for blood to begin to flow. He falls down to the ground. He calls out, As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. He rushes toward Habib ibn Mabahar al Asadi in the same way as he did for all of the other companions. He to console him. He wipes off the tears. He wipes off that blood. He hugs him and he embraces him as he's in his final moments. But my dear friends, I want to fast forward for just a couple of weeks. Just fast forward to a couple of weeks after the day of Ashura. It is said that on the night of the 11th of Muharram, the Umayyads, they came and every single one the family members and the companions of Hussein, not only did they kill them, but one by one they began to mutilate their bodies and they began to sever their heads. And amongst the heads that they severed was that of Habib ibn Mabahir. And it is said that as this caravan was moving from Kerbera to Kufa and from Kufa to Damascus, all of the women and the children, they were being paraded behind the heads of their loved ones. And it is said that there was one small boy, he was five, six years old. He kept on looking at one head that was on the top of a spear. And it is said that that head, for whatever reason, had fallen down from that spear. And this boy, he let out a scream and everyone looked at him. And even from amongst the enemy, they looked at him and they said, Oh young boy, what is it that you're screaming about? He says, Oh men, oh men, please have mercy for that is the head of my father, Habib ibn Mabahir al-Asadi. But at this I'll leave you my dear friends when the daughter of Hussein cried for her head what happened for those of you who know the story she looked at the head of her father Abba Abdullah and she embraced it and only after a few moments she was no more we raise our hands in supplication and in dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask God to allow for these tears and this grief to be a means for which we connect with Muhammad and his family we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that by these tears that he forgives our sins and then he responds to our supplications we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to our life we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resemble 
our life in the same way of the life of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to resemble our death in the same way as the death of Muhammad and Wa'ali Muhammad. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to never separate us from the Prophet and his family in this life, nor in the barzakh, nor in the next life. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to take the values and the themes from these days of Ashura. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability and the potential to create change in this community in the same way that Hussein alayhi salam stood for that change. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessing of this gathering to continue over the next several nights. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the ziyara of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam in this life and his shafa'a in the next life. I could ask you all to recite one Surah Al-Fatiha, but before that, you're allowed a salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Yeah, I'll say.